Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major patching and change management topics in Domain 7 to understand how they relate and to guide your studies. This is the fourth of six videos for Domain 7. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are one part of our complete CISSP masterclass. Patch management, the proactive process to monitor for new vulnerabilities and patch releases, acquire or create patches, evaluate them, prioritize, schedule the installation, deploy, verify, document, and update baselines. Why do we proactively do all of this? From a security perspective, patching is about creating a consistently configured environment that is secure against known vulnerabilities. We want to ensure that all of our systems that need to be patched are patched in a timely manner, creating a consistently configured environment. An important limitation of patch management is that we can only patch for known vulnerabilities. So we cannot, for instance, patch for zero days because we don't know about them. The first step in the patch management process is to proactively determine if a patch is available. And let me re-emphasize proactive. Organizations must have processes in place to identify if new patches are available. As most software and systems do not have auto-update features or provide notification when new patches are available, a few ways organizations can identify a need to patch include threat intelligence, vendor notifications, and various types of scanning. Threat intelligence is where organizations gather information about new threats and threat actors that could cause harm to their environment. This process can identify when patching is required by identifying vulnerabilities that could be exploited by newly identified threats. Another method of identifying a need to patch is when the vendor tells you a patch is available. This is easy with systems that have a built-in notification system like Windows and iOS devices as examples. But many software and systems have no built-in notification capability. So it's up to the organization to subscribe to a vendor's mailing list, RSS feed, or Twitter account, and monitor these feeds to identify relevant new patches. As part of maintaining a consistently configured environment, organizations also need to proactively scan their systems to ensure they are in compliance with baselines. In other words, to ensure that all the required patches have been installed in a timely manner. There are a few ways that this can be done. An agent is a small piece of software that is installed on a system to monitor that system and report on the current patch level of the system. Agentless implies that there is no agent, no software installed on the target system to report on patch levels. Instead, a scanning tool is used to connect, remotely connect to systems and query each system as to its current patch level. These scans can be run periodically as part of verifying compliance to baselines. And finally, a more subtle technique of checking a system's patch level is not to install an agent or use a tool to query the system remotely, Instead, we carefully inspect network packets being sent by the system. I spoke of fingerprinting in Domain 6 video on vulnerability assessment, essentially the idea that we can determine the exact version of a system, and thus its patch level, by closely inspecting the exact construction of network packets, as there will be subtle differences in the way different versions of software construct packets. Why would you ever use passive techniques to determine patch levels? typically because the systems we want to ensure are being patched are not directly in our control. Think systems managed for us by a vendor or service provider. We want to verify that the vendor is patching the systems in a timely manner. Now, once a need to patch has been identified, we prioritize, schedule, deploy, verify, and document the patch through the change management process, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes here. One of the most important things we have to ensure from a patching perspective is that patches are installed in a timely manner. In other words, if a new vulnerability has been identified that is actively being exploited, we may need to deploy a, pa a new patch extremely rapidly and treat it as an emergency change. When it comes to deploying or installing patches, we always want to try and minimize the impact to the organization, which is why patching is often performed in the middle of the night and coordinated with operations. There are two main methods that we can use to deploy patches, automated and manual patching. Automated patching means we use software to automate the installation of patches. For example, the auto update feature built into Windows. Automated patching is a good way to deploy patches quickly across a large number of systems. But it's typically not a great idea to auto update high value mission critical servers as patching 
can sometimes break existing functionality. This is why we tend to use manual patching for high value systems. We want a system administrator to be manually installing the patch and verifying that the patch fixed what it needed to or added some new functionality. And through regression testing, the system administrator can verify that no existing functionality has been broken. Now let's talk change management. Change management is the process that ensures that the costs and benefits of changes are analyzed and that changes are made in a controlled manner to reduce risk. High level. This is what the change management process looks like. We need a rigorous process to ensure that we understand how big of a deal a requested change is. What will it cost? How much effort will it take? How bad would it be for the organization if the change doesn't go well? This is what we're looking at as part of the impact assessment. The results of the impact assessment are a critical input for the rest of the process. For instance, if it's a major change that's going to cost millions, you probably need to get approval from a whole bunch of senior stakeholders. Conversely, if it's a super minor change, auto approval might be totally sufficient. Once a change is approved, you have to do an appropriate amount of building and testing of the change. You need to notify the right people at different steps throughout the change process. We'll talk about that in a moment. You then need to implement the change, do an appropriate amount of validation testing after the change is made, and update various things after the change is made, such as DRP or BCP plans or configuration baselines. And very importantly, there needs to be good documentation through every step of the change management process. All right, let's dig into this step by step now. The change management process begins with a change request. Change requests can come from practically anywhere. A system owner wanting some new functionality, a customer identifying a bug in a system, the results of a root cause analysis from an incident, or even through threat intelligence that we need to patch a system. For every change request that comes in, an impact assessment must be performed. Is this a minor change requiring little effort and will have zero impact on customers? Or is it a massive change requiring hundreds of hours of development, millions of dollars, and will have a very significant impact on multiple stakeholders from across the organization and customers if something goes wrong? Or is this a high priority patch that we need to treat as an emergency change and get it deployed yesterday? The impact assessment drives the rest of the change management process. What degree of approvals are required? what level of testing and validation, who needs to be notified, etc. The change management process needs to be flexible to address these different types of changes. Ideally, we also want a flexible approval process. For minor changes, we may allow auto approval. And at the other end of the spectrum, we may have changes that require multiple levels of approval from various stakeholders across the organization and everything is signed in triplicate. What drives these different approval requirements is the impact the change will have on the various stakeholders, the level of effort required to implement the change, whether it's an emergency change, etc. When it comes to getting approval from stakeholders across the organization, this is where CCBs, CABs, and ECABs come in. These are groups of people who are subject matter experts from across the organization. Change control boards, CCBs, focus on approving changes within specific projects. Change advisory boards, CABs, cover approval of changes related to entire service life cycles, entire major systems. Emergency change advisory, executive change advisory boards focus on really significant changes that could have a major impact on the organization. And there's sometimes even emergency change management boards for obviously emergency changes. Also, approvals are not just required right before a change is made. Approvals may be required at various steps throughout the change management process. Changes, things like new software, patches, a new camera system, or a new front gate, need to be built and tested before they're deployed into production. The notification step where we notify relevant stakeholders about a change is stuck here in the middle, but it is important to note that notifications occur throughout the change management process, before, possibly during, and after a change has been made. And who are these relevant stakeholders that need to be notified? Anyone that is impacted by the change system owners, management, administrators, customers, maybe even regulators. Implementation is where, of course, we make the change, which then requires validation. Testing. Is the new functionality the change was supposed to provide working correctly? And regression testing specifically validates that existing functionality was not broken by the implementation of the change. And finally, once a change has been made, we need to check to see if few things need to be updated, including master images, configuration baselines, disaster recovery plans, etc. 
All right, that is an overview of patching and change management within Domain 7, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. Busy life, only a few hours to study per week. Our CISB Masterclass adjusts to your schedule. You can learn more about our CISB Masterclass here at desktcom forward slash CISSP. Thank you.